Welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast with Dr. Brad Watts, making heroes in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. Now, here's Dr. Watts. What's up, Nutrition Hero family? This is Dr. Brad Watts. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast today. If you have been away for a while, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes, I want to make sure to highlight a few things for you. Number one, the previous episode, one of my favorite, it was an interview with Dr. Ruben Valdez, functional medicine provider out of Miami, Florida. And because this podcast is dedicated to not just advancing and protecting the science of functional medicine, but the art, I'd really appreciate it if you could listen to the heart and listen to the art of Dr. Ruben Valdez. Something that not a lot of people can communicate accurately or effectively, rather. <laughs> and uh, so something that I really appreciated with him is he just opened it up, let us feel what's been going on in the FM world and his FM world. And um, so some of the characteristics, some of the things that uh, go into being an effective functional medicine provider. So hopefully you got some value out of that. And I know you did. I know a few of you did, at least. I got some emails and good questions, good questions. So we'll address a few of those things today. Today is less art, more science in the functional medicine world. Haven't done a lot of that yet on a functional medicine podcast here. So we're going to get into it a little bit today. And I'm just going to plant the title here for you. We're looking at the pleiotropic role of HDL. What does that mean? Pleiotropic role, so more than one effect, and we're talking about genetic expression when it comes to HDL. So there's this thing in functional medicine, and not really functional medicine, rather. There's this thing in medicine where it says, hey, you're going to be okay because your total cholesterol is low and your HDL is high. It's the best I've ever seen. You're going to live forever. And the question is, is, is that true? <laughs> is that true? And so I've gotten some questions recently from... Uh, clinicians in different areas of the country that have been asking, what's the deal with this elevated HDL? Or what's the deal with this suppressed HDL? Talking about HDL today. So number one, we're looking at high-density lipoprotein. And in the cardiovascular world of medicine in the United States, high HDL is better than low HDL. And the question is, is why? What does it mean? And so HDL is a reverse cholesterol transporter which basically means that HDL goes out and it removes cholesterol from the peripheral tissues and it takes it all the way back to the liver so that we can reprocess it. Essentially, if you have oxidized cholesterol, we end up in a situation where it's inflammatory. And so that's where the advent of all of these medications and the crazy stuff that's happening in the world of medicine today come into to play, that come into effect, is basically taking that cholesterol level and lowering it so that you don't plug up, right? Well, in the functional medicine world, there's this HDL value that we measure on every single patient that you're running blood chemistry on. And if you're not, you should be. <laughs> and looking at this, the question is, is, is more better? And what does it show us when there's elevations or depressions? And so I want to get into that today because this is stuff that you can use tomorrow in your uh, clinical presentation that you're seeing with your patients. So there's a rule of thumb that I don't know where I learned it, uh, probably from one or two of my mentors had mentioned it to me, but there's this rule of thumb when we look at HDL cholesterol, and it's a rule that I've participated in for seven or eight years now, that when you see HDL above 65, you've got to start asking questions as, as like, why is it there? Is it there because it's beneficial or is it there because we're forcing the body to protect itself from something? So that's the question. And that's really where this podcast came from is somebody asked that question to me and I wanted to make sure that I gave them a more well-rounded answer. So um, if that's you listening here, here's your answer. So the HDL value is oftentimes in response to inflammation. Yes, like say your name is Patty. Yeah, Patty, you have a high level of inflammation in your body right now, and your body is responding to that inflammation by producing an epic amount of HDL. Look at your value You're at 105, and this is not as rare as you would think, by the way. And so if we look at your HDL value at 105, it's, it's nice that the body can produce that, 
but we don't want it to have to do that. That's the point. So it's kind of like, um, you know, doctor, if you are like, if you could go run 27 miles today, it's nice that you could go do that, but you don't want to have to do that every day, right? It's nice that you could run away from, you know, a, a bear in the woods, <laughs> but you don't want to have to do that every day. Um, we talk about what's like what happens when you have to run away from like harm in that situation, right? Stress is what happens. Same thing with HDL. If you have high levels of HDL because of oxidative stress, it's nice that you can do it, but what in the heck? It's not the lifestyle you want to be living, right? So in this instance, blood chemistry is a way for us to assess this, and HDL is a barometer that we can use that allows us to figure out are your patients dealing with a high level of inflammation or is the HDL itself the inflammatory problem, right? Like that's a whole new egg to crack there, but it's something that's super valuable, especially if you're treating patients and you're supporting patients that have autoimmune conditions. So when we look at HDL as a benefit, it's because of that RCT, that reverse cholesterol transport. Remember that, RCT, that's the value of HDL. It's like a vacuum cleaner, and it just walks around, binds stuff up, takes it back to the liver, moving in the right direction in a healthy individual, right? So you can see significant decreases in cardiovascular disease mortality and just overall cardiovascular disease um, complication when the HDL values are in a normal laboratory range. And remember how they get those normal laboratory ranges as it's just a statistical analysis of whoever gets tested in a geographic area. So the question is, is, is the lab range correct, number one? And then number two, when the lab range says greater than 40 for your goal, is really, is it greater than 40? Like what if it's 100? Is that better than 45? Is 85 better than 60? So these are the questions that I want to get into today to see if we can bring a little common sense to the situation. And uh, so let's go back to our pleiotropic effect, which basically means that we have multiple effects from HDL. They're not all reverse transport effects, or they're not all uh, decreasing inflammation, right? So cholesterol membrane homeostasis, right? So every membrane in your body is linked to some level of phospholipid uh, situation. And so when we look at this, are we looking at a situation where HDLs can basically create signaling pathways? Yes. So the HDL helps us. It plays an important role in activating the communication between cells. That's kind of cool to think about. Helps transport ATP binding uh, your proteins. Okay, well, you kind of need that as well. So when we talk about cell transport we talk about signaling between cells and we talk about actual communication between cells. That's where HDL comes into play. So when you're dealing with a low HDL situation, we have lack of cellular communication between systems. What takes place? We get a lot of static, a lot of uh, uncommunication, if that's a, a word that I can throw out there for you. And to break it down, by the way, we're speaking in terms that your patients can understand. That's what you want to be able to deliver, so master that. Your patients don't care when you use words like, yes, the ABC G1 particle and the structure and the lipid composition are all appropriate for this cell membrane. Your patients don't care, okay? So make sure that you're speaking in terms here. Well, cell can talk to cell when HDL is doing its job, right? That's what it boils down to. So the point is, is that when HDL is low, Yes, you can have a problem with intracellular communication, and that creates static or miscommunication. When we have miscommunication, we end up with dis-ease, and we end up in a problem in the long run where the patients are just getting sick. So keep that in mind. So low HDL is not good. You know that intuitively just from your training, and you're beat over the head with it when you go to the medical doctor. So when we look at a... A situation where HDL can be beneficial, we're looking at how HDL supports humoral immunity. So we're supporting antigen presentation. We're supporting uh, your innate immunity as HDL values are normal. So when we're fighting things, um, it could be a common cold. 
It could be um, an autoimmune condition. So when we talk about the immune system, um, in a very, very rudimentary and basic situation, we're talking about a teeter-totter. And it has two sides to a teeter-totter, and we want that teeter-totter to be balanced. And it ebbs and flows as you get presented with new and different diseases or new and different uh, antigens. Maybe a common cold. Maybe, um, you know, some dirt you stepped in in the garden, something like that, okay? So that teeter-totter will ebb and flow. And so let's give that teeter-totter two names just for this basic example, TH1 and TH2, T helper cell 1, T helper cell 2. Now, we can talk, and there have been obviously texts about this, volumes and volumes of the immune system text, and it's like the final frontier in medicine, in my opinion. But looking at this, if we look and basically break it down to the teeter-totter, if the teeter-totter is tilted, genetically speaking, it's in uh, out of balance or it's imbalanced, your patient's going to have a problem. Your patient is going to be experiencing some level of a disease process or maybe not even a disease at that point. Maybe it's still on the front end where we're just looking at a functional imbalance or a dis ease or a, um, a, an unfair or an unbalanced distribution of immune system activity. And so HDL helps your patients regulate that. And what's awesome is that uh, we look at things like uh, pentraxins, right? So pentraxins, things like C-reactive protein. We measure this in a functional medicine way. Pentraxins are basically a, a family of of acute phase protein. So if somebody has a heart attack, what are you gonna measure uh, in uh, the emergency room? They're gonna look at C-reactive protein. When a pentraxin is elevated, your doctor is gonna get animated. The same way that a functional medicine provider is gonna get animated when a pentraxin is elevated. We look at that vitamin C connection to this, which maybe we won't get into that just yet, but um, C-reactive protein is what we're talking about here, okay? It's something that we would call a short pentraxin, a short pentraxin. Now, HDL, HDL is going to allow release of these pentraxins. And so if you have a patient that has decreased HDL and they have all of the signs of cardiovascular disease, okay, so this is the point I want you to write down about this. If you have a patient that has decreased HDL, they have all of the signs and symptoms physically of a cardiovascular condition, but their C-reactive protein is not elevated. The question is, is the C-reactive protein a valid test for them because they have low HDL? I would suggest no. I would suggest no. So if you go, hey, Bob, you're 280 pounds. Your cholesterol values are 175 on atorvastatin, your HDL is 30, and your C-reactive protein is 2.5. You are in the average risk category for heart attack and stroke. That's a statement that you would logically present to the patient just reading their laboratory reports. I'm going to ask you to change your opinion here because these pentraxins, such as C-reactive protein, are going to be inhibited in their production by a low HDL a low HDL, all right? So super important because you don't want to give somebody the thumbs up, you're out of the clear, all right? Nope, no issue, no worry for you. When, um, you know, theoretically, do you actually know? That's the question, all right? So remember that low HDL and low C-reactive protein does not mean you're out of the clear. Low C-reactive protein you see that and you go, this guy is overweight. He has metabolic syndrome like nobody's business. He's already had a heart attack. Why is his C-reactive protein so normal? Check the HDL. That's the takeaway here, okay? Check the HDL. So C-reactive protein is called a pentraxin. Pentraxins can be inhibited by low HDL growth or low HDL production, I should say. All right. That's really cool. That's a functional medicine takeaway that no other provider in your community is going to have for them. And when your provider, um, like medical provider in your community tells your patient, your, your C-reactive protein's awesome, you're not going to have a heart attack, right? Just stay on this medication. We'll suppress your cholesterol value. HDL needs to rise a little bit, but we don't really know what to do about that. Maybe you should just exercise a little bit more. You'll be fine, right? What that means is, 
doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. And it's not because they're not trying. It's because they haven't been looking at it through a functional mechanism or a functional lens. And so for you, it's your job as the functional medicine provider to be able to remember stuff like this. And so I'm just giving it to you here in a bite-sized piece of information because you're going to use it tomorrow. Okay, so remember that. You're going to use it tomorrow. So let's talk about autoimmune conditions in HDL here for a minute. Right, We're going to transition from this situation where cardiovascular disease, obviously we know higher HDL is better. Why? All of these reasons. Right Now let's talk about autoimmune conditions. Plasma HDL levels, they can modify uh, or are modified, I should say, by a number of autoimmune diseases. Uh, for instance, HDL can be very elevated in multiple sclerosis. Right? Interesting can be very reduced or suppressed by SLE, systemic lupus uh, erythematosus, okay? So SLE, in my clinical career, the worst thing that I can have a patient walk in the door with is SLE. That's just for me. I don't know. That's the worst thing. It drives me crazy because it's so transient, so transient. When I was reading this research the other day, I was like, oh, that makes sense. And here, here's the thing that makes sense, okay? So SLE can be multiple systems, right? So it's not just like, oh, it's affecting your skin or your eyes, right? Or the, your, your arteries. It's not just that. It's all three of them at the same time. And so you have symptoms with your patient that you're trying to control, and you go, well, how in the heck is this going to get any better? We can't even get one of these things pinned down. And so here's what happens. If we end up in a situation where... We have uh, HDL very high, and the patient has symptoms of SLE that nobody's diagnosing. This is a warning sign. This is the bell that should be dinging in your head that says, hey, HDL is really high. This patient already has been diagnosed with Hashimoto's. What if they also have SLE, right? So these are for your Hashimoto's patients that you're treating that are not getting better. Or your Hashimoto's patients that you're treating and like, they have an awesome day and then three terrible days and then three great days and then five bad days. And you're going, this is no way to live for them. Right? So very interesting. Also, HDL elevated, by the way, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, AS, ankylosing spondylitis. Don't like to see that one. Psoriatic arthritis. You see that every now and again in a functional medicine perspective. But this is the one I wanted to get to. HDL can be elevated in your patients that have inflammatory bowel issues. Inflammatory bowel... How many of your diabetes patients have inflammatory bowel issues? Oh my goodness. Right? It's crazy. It's crazy. How many of your autoimmune patients have inflammatory bowel issues? Almost all of them, right? Almost all of them. So people that have chronic autoimmune conditions... They also maintain a chronic inflammatory status, right? That's the nature of the disease. And so what it does is it accelerates their cardiovascular disease because of it. So if you have somebody that has um, like SLE, lupus, they're a candidate for cardiovascular conditions much more frequently and much earlier than a typical um, like metabolic syndrome patient. And that is the thing that we need to be able to watch out for. These people have high HDL. And they are a candidate for increased chronic inflammatory issues as it accelerates atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. That is a huge issue. And as a functional medicine provider, there is nobody that is better equipped to step in in this situation than you. So today, because we're doing this NSL situation, never stop learning, I want to just make sure that this is on your radar as a provider. It took me a lot of years to figure this out. You know how many patients that I feel like I personally, um, I'm careful how I say this, but patients that you felt like years later, you, you learned something and you go, oh man, I really wish I would have known that for Bob or Susan back in the day, right? Oh my gosh. Well, this is one of them when we talk about SLE. How many patients do you have that could potentially have SLE and nobody's diagnosing it because they're not putting the puzzle pieces together? 
And because when you get diagnosed with SLE in a medical situation, your life has already been destroyed. It's not a, hey, let's check for it. It's a, oh crap, somebody missed this for the last five years and you have SLE. That's typically how it gets diagnosed, right? So in, in uh, this presentation where HDL is elevated, okay, you as a functional medicine provider are not jumping for joy because they're never going to have a heart attack. You're cautiously looking at them and saying, wow, I wonder if it's an autoimmune condition that's like allowing the HDL value to be so elevated. Chronic inflammatory issue. What if it's lupus, right? So that's the thing that we want to look for because as a functional medicine provider, you are building customized and custom engineered rather lifestyles for people because the customized lifestyle is what helps them control the expression of their autoimmune condition. And so when we have these tools available to us, this testing that allows us to customize a lifestyle for a patient, what we're doing is we're hopefully stop pouring gas on the fire of their autoimmune condition or of their metabolic syndrome, right? So what's interesting is that um, when we look at patients with SLE, I'm just picking on SLE right now, but it could be rheumatoid arthritis. It could be um, Sjogren's. It could be, you know, any the inflammatory bowel conditions. Those are, those are the ones that are the most common, the IBS, IBD, all right, in my opinion. And um, so when we look at this, just from a, maybe it's because I'm in the Midwest and everybody's obsessed with corn, right? Uh, and corn and wheat. But the point is, is that they walk into my clinic a lot more often than uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So when we look at this and you see high HDL, your the, the warning bell's got to be going off, right? And some of the metabolic disturbances that you're going to walk in with, um, like atherogenic dyslipidemia, write that down if you've never heard of that one before, okay? Atherogenic dyslipidemia, okay? This is important. This is a high HDL situation where the patients are struggling with uh, calcification of their arteries, right? Maybe it's a, you know, a metabolic syndrome. Maybe it's a metabolic syndrome. Uh, what's interesting is these patients that have autoimmune conditions are generating atherogenic dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome much more often than somebody that does not have an autoimmune condition. That's in the medical literature. That is like a take it to the bank situation um, here's, here's why this is so important, right? So is it possible that metabolic syndrome, i.e. your patients that are dealing with diabetes, is it possible that this is stemming from autoimmune condition and the missing link here, the thing, the flag waving in the wind for the functional medicine provider is the high HDL. So your patients aren't necessarily going to walk in with you know, two thousand dollars worth of laboratory testing, and a doctor's visit, and a um, you know explanations that say, "Hey, I have SLE, or I have inflammatory bowel syn uh, syndrome, or I have whatever," and um, that's what's causing my metabolic syndrome. Okay, the patient's not going to walk in with that. They're going to walk in with the doctor saying they have metabolic syndrome. Right? It's our job to make sure that the diagnosis is the starting point, not the finishing point. Like anybody can train a monkey to, to see a high blood sugar and then, all right, these are the pills you get for high blood sugar. So don't continue to do that in a functional medicine setting the same way that the standard of care is right now, okay? So we have to ask questions that take us deeper than, oh, yeah, you have metabolic syndrome or you have type 2 diabetes. Oh, yes, you have dyslipidemia. Yes, yes. Like here's what we do for that. No. Here's what we do. We collect more information as a functional medicine provider. Never stop learning. So I'm getting up on a soapbox here a little bit because I just it gets me so intense when um, you go to a seminar and you meet another chiropractor, a nutritionist, or a medical doctor, that, and they're like, hey, yeah, I practice functional medicine. And really what they're doing is just, you know, they're in um, you know, some multi-level marketing thing, which is not bad. I don't care about multi-level marketing, but they're using the multi-level marketing tools, the advertising tools to generate revenue. And I get it, but don't call it functional medicine because functional medicine, you need to test, 
You need to make sure that you are building a case for your patients. You need to make sure that you are fighting for them in an informational setting so that you can walk them in the right direction. Teach them to get better. Teach them to be better people, not just better patients. And so that's the process that you want to make sure you're, you're doing. And HDL can be your flag for this. It can be the warning sign. It can be the thing that helps you crack the case for a patient. And I just I want to make sure that it's not something we accept as it's low. Oh, that's because you have heart disease. It's high. Oh, this is awesome. This is The reason this came up, by the way, is because I had a patient who on their doctor's report, the doctor said, this is the best HDL I've seen in the last 60 days. It was 105. This is the best HDL I've seen in the last 60 days. You are at zero risk for heart attack and stroke because of this. And I almost lost it. Like, like not I'm the patient, but like almost lost it. I was like, this cannot be happening. Does this doctor know? Have they ever read anything about HDL other than what the book is telling them? Oh, my goodness. So let's not let that be you. All right. So anyway. Here's the summary of my 30-minute uh, rant here today. Uh, here's the summary. HDL is a way for us to question further the diagnosis that your patient walks in with. Is it low because of the inflammatory issue? Is it low because of the inflammatory issue? Or is it high because of an inflammatory issue? That's the thing that we got to be asking. That's the thing that has to be at the forefront of our questioning strategies when it comes to your patients, especially the ones dealing with metabolic syndrome, especially the ones dealing uh, like post heart attack patients. That right there is the key. That has to be like stamped in your memory that when somebody walks in the door, where they have metabolic syndrome or post heart attack, whatever it is, make sure that their diagnosis is not the end point. It's got to be the beginning of exploration for the rest of your patient's experience. It's going to help serve you, yes. It's going to take you to a new level as a provider, as a person. But what's awesome is that type of mentality is going to take your patients, and this is the most important thing, it's going to take your patients to a new level of health, a new layer of living that they're not going to get without you. So that's the key overall. All right. Thanks for listening today, you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Blessings until we see you next time.